If you're planning on picking up an 11th generation Intel CPU, like the 11400F, 11600K, or God forbid an 11900K, should you be splashing out on a ludicrously expensive Z590 board, or save a bit of cash and buy a B561 instead? Well, in this video, I want to explain what B560 is, the differences between it and Z590 boards, and uh, actually test the performance and see if it's worth going with one of those and saving a bit of money instead of splashing it instead. So stick around. But first, a message from this video's sponsor, Curve. I've been using Curve for a little while now, and it's incredibly useful and convenient having all of my cards, including my Tesco Club card, built into one. The 1% cashback is also a welcome bonus, and their go back in time feature is really cool. Being able to swap which card made a purchase up to 90 days after buying is really useful, especially for me being able to swap between my business and personal cards, or even just between debit and credit. You can check out Curve and sign up today at the link in the description below. Sign up to their free blue card and get £5 free when you make your first purchase through Curve. V560, much like AMD's B550 boards, are the middle tier in Intel's product stack. The main difference between B and Z series boards are the lack of overclocking on these B ones. Intel still uses the take features away to sell them back to you at a higher price methodology, and so even with an unlocked CPU, a K SKU chip like the 11900K, you cannot overclock this, at least using the multiplier. There are also a few features missing compared to Z590 boards, like the new adaptive boost technology that the i9-11900K gets on Z590 boards. That's not here or present or available on this B560 one, at least right now. There's also hardware differences in the link to the chipset, that is X4 DMI 3.0 on B560, whereas on Z590 with one of the new 11th generation Rocket Lake chips, it's X8, which means that on these boards you have effectively half the bandwidth uh, available to the chipset, so even though these boards, this uh, B560 board has three M.2 slots, you'll only be able to use two of them at full speed without any bottlenecks. You can, however, still use PCI Gen 4, assuming you're using an 11th generation chip in the top M.2 slot, as that's directly connected to the CPU, and the two X16 slots that are also directly connected to the CPU. The VRMs on these B560 boards, unlike AMD's A520 board that I checked out recently, video in the cards above, are well suited to the power hungry monsters that are the 11th generation chips. This MSI uh, B560 Tomahawk has a 12 plus 2 plus 1 phase setup and some hefty, like chunky heat sinks on uh, both sides, uh, which keep it relatively cool. I decided to stress test it with the 11900K uh, and my IR gun read around 60 degrees Celsius under full load after uh, about half an hour of rendering in Blender uh, right next to this, the socket, next to the VRMs and uh, the reported temperature in software was around 80 degrees Celsius so that's well within the, the tolerances that I would expect for VRMs like this especially being pushed literally as hard as they can and so I'd be pretty comfortable running that configuration myself. So should you buy a B560 board rather than a Z590 one? Well, I thought it would be important to test if you lose any performance by using this cheaper chipset instead. Now I'm testing with the 11900K here again because this is going to be the biggest difference, the most visible change, and I should make it clear that because ABT or Adaptive Boost Technology doesn't appear to be available, at least on this board right now, well you're going to be losing a reasonable amount of performance just by not having that enabled. But when taking a look at stock for stock numbers versus Z590 and B560, it's not all that different. In single-threaded workloads like Cinebench R20 and single-threaded test, it's pretty much in line with the stock numbers. You do lose a couple of points compared to with ABT enabled, but that was never the key selling point of ABT is that mostly works on all cores, which you can see quite clearly because the stock numbers 
pretty much match up in the multi-threaded run, but when you compare it to ABT, there's a pretty big performance gap there. In Blender and the BMW scene, the B560 board took two seconds or so longer to render the scene. That's not a big deal, but it could be something to consider. Although again, comparing to with ABT enabled on Z590, that's seven seconds faster. In Gooseberry, it's actually a reasonable amount slower than even the stock figure. It's 21 seconds slower overall and almost 40 seconds slower than it with ABT enabled. In the Puget Bench suite for the Adobe CC apps, uh, it's actually pretty close to the stock numbers. Although again, with Adaptive Boost enabled, you get around 10% more performance. So uh, with this sort of higher end chip, you will see a bit of a difference thanks to that missing feature. What about gaming? Well, that's less of an issue. In Watch Dogs, you only drop four FPS at 1080p ultra settings, which definitely wouldn't be noticeable in games. Although in Cyberpunk, it is a little bit bigger at eight FPS average slower and nearly 20 FPS lower in the 1% low numbers, something that you might be able to feel while playing. But remember, this is the i9, not the i5s. In Fortnite, it's well within margin of error. Technically the 1% lows are 10 FPS less, but when we're talking about 150 versus 160 at the 1% lows, you won't really be feeling that too much. So with the i9, you can notice a difference if in a lot of cases it's only slight. But if you're gonna spend 500 pounds on a CPU, well, one, don't buy that one, and two, uh, spending 50 pounds extra to get a Z590 board instead, well, that does kinda seem worth it. But what about the i5s? Well, I've tested those with Z590 and with this B560 board, and there is no performance difference. Because they don't get any special sauce boost algorithms, there is next to no performance difference, certainly none really notable, all within margin of error of each other, and you're gonna get more performance from just having a good cooler and good power supply to be able to power these things than you are from changing from B560 to Z590. The only drawback would be if you're buying one of the k skew chips like the 11600K, you won't be able to use the multiplier to overclock that chip, if, you, that's, if that's something you're interested in, although bear in mind that changing the multiplier will void your warranty, as will setting your RAM to anything more than 3200 megahertz. With that said, if overclocking is a very key feature that you're definitely sure you're gonna be doing, then yeah, go buy a Z590 board instead. But for the, the normal folks, for the 98% or whatever it is that don't overclock your CPU, B560, is a great option. These B560 boards offer a much better value proposition than their Z590 counterparts, especially now that Intel has graced us with memory overclocking supports back on the B-series chipsets. That means that you can run any memory speeds you like. Admittedly, again, that will void your warranty if it's over 3,300 megahertz, but it's still a good way to eke out a bit of extra performance. And you can still use the PL1, PL2 and Tau profile changes to eke out a bit more performance there too. If you're planning on buying an 11400F, these B560 boards are the perfect match. Save your money, don't buy Z590 instead. Uh, like I said, get a good cooler for your chip as that will get the, the most performance out of it possible and you will have a, a, the exact same experience you would if you had a Z590 board, but with a bit more money in your pocket. If you're planning on buying the 11600K, like I said, B560 is still probably your best bet, as the vast majority of people who even buy those chips don't overclock them, so unless you're dead set uh, and sure that you will be overclocking, well, I'll probably buy one of these too. Same goes to the i7, same rules apply, uh, and the power consumption still isn't really that much of an issue on this style of board, where the VRMs are clearly capable of handling even the i9's level of power, so the i7 will be just fine. Personally, I'm really glad to see Intel at least seemingly heading in the right direction here. I would still like to see B-series boards be able to overclock k skew chips, or I guess if you're worried about uh, the, the weak VRMs that could come on a, a B-series board, then switch it the other way around and let users overclock non k skew chips on Z-series boards. I think that's something that you could give back to the community and that they could access if they buy Ryzen instead, but wouldn't cannibalize your own product stack. So you've heard my thoughts on Intel's B-series boards. I'd love to hear what you think in the comments down below. 
What do you think of the B560 chipset? Is that one you would get yourself? Uh, if you are planning on picking up an 11th gen chip, which board or which uh, chipset are you planning on picking up? And if you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments down below too. I'll be leaving links to the B-series boards and the 11th generation chips in the description down below. Those will be Amazon affiliate links that will take you to your local Amazon store where you can see pricing when and where you watch this because they can and do vary. There's also a load of other links in the description you can check out from merch or hoodies or t-shirts like this one or a load of other cool designs. Uh, or you can check out Patreon for access to our Money Men Discord chat, sponsor free videos, and of course you support me directly as well. There is also a whole load of other links down there, stuff like Overclock UK affiliate links if you're buying from them, VPN options, Humble Bundle, Streamlabs OBS, a load of stuff, feel free to check out, and I'll leave some more videos on the end cards. Otherwise, that's pretty much it. Thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you all in the next video.